Okay, I just want to check in. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. It's 11.15 a.m., so we're going to go ahead and begin the session. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the fourth session of the PPCL ECHO program. My name is Jody West, and I'll be the coordinator for today's ECHO session. And I want to go over a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, this is our agenda. We're going to do our best to adhere to the schedule. After I complete the housekeeping announcements, our facilita facilitator, Dr. Olivier, will lead us in introductions and then pass it to Margaret Smith, who will present our case for today. After Margaret presents, we will open the floor to any for clarifying questions, first from the community participants and then from the HUB team. Once all of the questions have been answered, we'll transition to provide recommendations to Margaret. Um, again, we'll start with the participants and then hear any additional recommendations from the HUB team. Then we'll briefly summarize all of the recommendations and then we'll move into the didactic presentation from Dr. Waldman. After that, I'll wrap up with announcements and close the session for today. Um, Dr. Olivier? Yeah, and just, um, we all should, we're all pretty familiar faces in, at this time, but um, we'll, we'll just briefly reintroduce ourselves, our role, um, and what we do. So I'm Dr. Christine Olivier. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I'm the facilitator on this ECHO project. Um, you just met Jody, who is the coordinator on the project, so I won't make her reintroduce herself. Um, Tanya? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Tanya Williams. I'm the Healthcare Innovation Manager with Wellahead, Louisiana, and I'm here today as Jody's backup support, um, handling some things behind the scenes for her so that this session runs smoothly. Happy to be here. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa Spence. I'm the pediatric nurse practitioner that at St. Bernard Community Health Center, and I also do um, behavioral health here as well. Thank you, Lisa. And Margaret Smith is going to be our case presenter today. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Margaret. I'm a social worker. Um, I'm employed with LSU's Family Medicine Residency Program, and we have a primary care clinic that I work with the residents and supporting the patients in their behavioral health, social determinants of health needs. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Brandy, I know you're under the weather. You want to briefly introduce yourself? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Brandy Dillon. I'm um, employed through Our Lady of Lords <laughs> School-Based Health Center. Time for recess. <laughs> Thank you, Brandy. <laughs> Dr. Queen? Hi, I'm Dr. Katie Queen. I'm a general pediatrician, also specialized in pediatric obesity, and I work for Our Lady of the Lake Children's Health. I practice out of Bogalusa, Louisiana, and Baton Rouge. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I saw Keisha Benoit kind of hop on and hop off. Um, also, Dr. Waldman will be joining us later. He's also a child and adolescent psychiatrist who was previously affiliated with LSU and just recently moved out to California. So he'll be joining us as the didactic presenter. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and move forward with um, to the uh, didactic presentation. Dr. Waldman has joined us and he is um, attending. And Dr. Waldman, I'll advance the slides for you. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with that. Hey everyone. I'm Daniel Waldman, I'm a child psychiatrist. Um, I'm sorry I showed up a little late. I was having some technical difficulties getting um, registered for the meeting. And um, yeah, that was a really interesting, complicated case. I kind of was browsing through, I would say for the IEP piece, the one thing that the parents can like, if they put something in writing to the school district that starts a, like a, a timer on the school has a certain amount of time to respond to that request. And then they need to kind of implement some, it's like a response to intervention plan um, to see if that kid, uh, see if a child will qualify. Um, so that's something that they can do right away. But if they just say it, then the school can kind of put it off and put it off. And, but if they have it in writing, then um, there's a legal requirement that they respond within. I don't, so some of y'all might know, I don't know that, I think it's 60 days that they have to respond. Um, the um, child has to be attending school, of course, for them to count those days, um, which is sometimes a challenge for our, our kiddos. 
campus. Um, so the, this is just, I, uh, we have a, a limited amount of time. So I wanted to kind of go over some really um, high yield stuff in terms of crisis management. Um, I'm, this is gonna be fairly general, but hopefully we can all like think of a case and this, you can think of one of these eight times this young lady had been to the hospital. Um, so if, uh, if you have a child in crisis presenting to you in clinic, um, here's some some tools that I think are really helpful to think about. And here's some of the ways that I, I've been taught to think about it and I've kind of evolved in thinking about it myself. So the first um, thing I wanna talk about is just that there are different kinds of crisis. Then we're gonna go over doing a risk assessment. There's a lots of different tools to do this, but I really like the um, National uh, Institute of Mental Health ASQ tool. Um, so I'll kind of walk y'all through that. Then we'll talk about the PEC and whether that's indicated and when to do it, and maybe get some feedback on what you guys think about that, because that's always tricky, like when to use the PEC in the outpatient setting. Um, talk about doing some safety planning with kids and families. And finally, consider like advocating for clinic policies that support crisis management if you are kind of responsible for uh, the mental health care in your area, like how to make sure your clinic is set up to do that. Okay, you can go ahead. Judy, thanks. Okay, so types of crisis, and we could spend like our whole time talking about this, but I think it's it's helpful like when a child comes into your office in crisis to really think about like where this crisis is coming from. Is this a crisis that is intrinsic to what's going on psychologically, psychiatrically? Um, with the patient, like a patient mental health crisis? Is this more of a caregiver crisis or the relationship between the parent and the, the patient? Is this a school crisis? Is this the school sending this child to you? Um, and maybe there's bullying involved, maybe there was a threat involved, but maybe this is something that's not really intrinsic to that patient. Um, or is this a developmental crisis? And I think we see a lot of this too, where you know kids with autism, or kids with other neurodevelopmental disabilities kind of go into crisis at various points in their lives. And that's not, um, so sometimes we just have to think through those crises a little differently. Today, we're gonna focus on this patient mental health crisis because I think that's the most common and the, these tools are most useful for that. So I just have a really general example, but we have a 13 year old boy with major depression and generalized anxiety coming to the office and expresses worsening suicidality. And the patient has, restarted cutting at home. Um, so how do we kind of even begin to think about this? Um, go ahead. Jody, can you click to the next? Thanks. Okay. So I think that the, the first step is asking the patient really straightforward, direct questions about this suicidal thinking. Um, there's, you know, when I'm working with trainees and myself, when I first started doing this, it's kind of uncomfortable asking these questions often. Um, and you I think that there is some natural kind of concern that bringing up these issues will somehow lead to kids be suggestive in some way and lead to kids thinking more about these. Because of that, they've actually studied this and they found that that just isn't the case. Like asking questions about suicidality does not lead to kids thinking, being more likely to contemplate suicide. And it, instead, it's kind of like a release valve for some of these issues. And if they weren't thinking about it, saying no to those questions, it's just kind of like out of sight, out of mind. It's not something that's suggestive for them. So, the, and the, I think these questions are really, really critical. In the past few weeks, have you ever wished you were dead? In the past few weeks, have you felt that you or your family would be better off if you were dead? Um, and that kind of plays into some of that guilt that we see a lot in major depression. In the past few weeks, have you had thoughts about killing yourself? So that's a, a more active intention behind that. And have you ever tried to kill yourself? Okay, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so regardless of what they answer to those questions, I think it's important to ask kids if they have a suicide plan. And that could be like, if you have a kid with kind of waxing and waning, chronic major depressive disorder, they may kind of 
even if like it hasn't happened in the past few weeks, they may already have like this plan set aside for like when when I am in crisis, this is what I'm going to do. So asking the, the patients directly at a, about a plan will help kind of guide your, your clinical decision making about how to handle the situation. Um, so and they have a note here that if the patient has a very detailed plan, this is more concerning that they haven't thought it through in great detail. Um, and I kind of break down plan, I kind of think about three levels of this. So I think about, do they have a method? Um, so do, like, oh, I would take pills. Um, do they have a plan? Okay. And I would take pills. Like I know my mom like goes to pick up my sibling at this time. I know where the pills are. I know like how to lock the bathroom. I know exactly that's like much more the plan. And then I always ask about intention to like, and are you going to do this? Or is this kind of like a rainy day thing? Or is this like, oh, it terrifies me even thinking about it, but I think that's what I would do. And the, those three levels of assessing kind of the depth of the suicidality has been super helpful. Um, the last thing is like, if there's a note involved, like communication about this, I find like um, much more kind of indicative of something kind of that they've really putting that in writing to a friend, to anyone has been like, it's really solidifying that thinking for them. Okay, we can go to the next one. Um, so past behavior. So have you ever tried to hurt yourself or have you ever tried to kill yourself? And then to kind of tease that out and ask kind of the details behind that and ask them, did they receive medical or psychiatric treatment? It's amazing how many kids will kind of disclose this and then say, oh, I actually never told this to anyone before. This is my first time saying this. So the parents in their mind, this is the first crisis for this child or the, the school or whomever is sending the child to see you. When in fact, the kid is, you know, gone through this in the past and it just like, oh, my mom was at the store. I took the pills and nothing. I like felt tired that night. And I slept it off. Nothing really happened. And that was six months ago. Um, and they never kind of received treatment in the interim. So asking them. And I think that this part is really key is that past suicidal behavior is the strongest risk factor for, for future attempts. So if kids have already done stuff like this, that's... Um, very, very concerning. Okay. Um, this this is important, I think. I think, you know, all of this can play into a risk assessment for suicidality. Um, certainly like associated underlying mental health problems. So you really wanna know what's going on, like why the child thinks that they're feeling this way. And the absence of these things doesn't, necessarily lead me to take it less seriously, but it does help me get a much kind of more comprehensive picture of what's going on. Um, and I think that hitting these key bullets is super important. So you want to ask about depression. Do you want to ask about it? You want to ask about anxiety, impulsivity and recklessness. Um, hopelessness is like a, a really foundational aspect to this. So are you kind of looking forward to anything in the future? Do you think this is going to get better? Um, anhedonia, um, are you able to enjoy things and find things that make you happy? Isolative behavior, irritability, substance use. Um, you know, it comes up a fair amount. Honestly, I see it, it's much less in our child population than in terms of playing into this than the adult population. but. Um, it's something that we definitely have to ask about sleep, appetite, and just kind of generally like what's different for them. I think trying to find out like, well, why now, like what's going on now is super important. Okay, Jody, you can go to the next one. Once I've kind of established, okay, we have um, really concerning symptoms internally as to what's going on in terms of suicidality to understand kind of this uh, tension between their social support and their, like what's stressing them out. So what support do they have? Is there a trusted adult you can talk to? Have you ever seen a therapist or counselor? 
the other day I was in clinic and I asked a kid, have you ever seen a therapist or counselor? And they're like, yeah, I've seen them. They're in the building. I'm like, that's not exactly what I mean, but I'm glad you like can identify who that person is. Um, but when I say, have you seen someone? Like, have you talked to someone? Um, family situation, I think, you know, and we see this every day with our kids, like what's going on in a, at home. Um, and I think in terms of coming, putting together a safety plan, that's going to be super key. It's like, what's the child's read on the family situation at home? Is there going to be that stable support for them? Um, school functioning, um, bullying, you really want to ask directly about bullying. It comes up so much with our kids. Um, and sometimes kids will say, I'm not bullied. And then they go on to describe what's happening, which is in fact, like what we would characterize as bullying. Um, so it's I don't necessarily think we need, there's like another way. I think it makes, I always ask directly, but um, then it's teasing out like, okay, well, like, why do you hate school then if you're not being, or like, I also kind of will um, kind of distance it from the child. Like, oh, is bullying an issue at your school? So it doesn't feel like you're, it's um, less personal and less kind of in their face and blaming them because they might feel like guilty or there's something wrong with them and that's why they're getting bullied. They may have internalized some of that with their self-esteem issues. So being able to like talk more generally about bullying in their school and then find out how it's affecting them is a way to get at that. Um, suicide contagion, anyone who's killed themselves or even if they've had like a recent loss in their family, it doesn't need to be necessarily because of suicide. It could be someone kind of had a freak accident or drowning or something can lead to kind of questioning like what's the point of all this and you kind of like thoughts about like not reason to be here anymore um reasons for living and i think this is a, an important question to ask in terms of um starting to put together that safety plan please what are some of the reasons you would not kill yourself go to the next slide um i'm not going to go through all these questions but i think it's always important to involve the a parent whenever we're talking about this. Like as soon as suicidality is disclosed, the parent needs to know about it and you need to gauge the parent's response to it to know kind of if safety planning is even possible. Um, like, are they gonna be supportive? Are they taking this seriously? Um, and is the child able to articulate what's going on in a, you know, they need to tell exactly how they're feeling, but they need to be able to tolerate talking about it with their parent in the room. Um, you can go to the next slide. How am I doing on time, Dr. Olivier? How much time do we have? We have about three minutes left. Okay. So let's talk really quickly about the PEC. I think all of y'all have probably seen this at some point. Um, I had to divide it into two pieces, but if we go to the, the next slide it's the bottom of it and that's kind of the the conclusion and the substance of it so if we want to go to the next oh here it is okay so we can go back one sorry so i think the the things that you want to decide if you're deciding whether or not to do a pec because it really needs to, to meet this criteria down here where it has the number one and number two and you you need to check a box for number one and number two. So both of those things need to be true. So is this person next a danger, a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or gravely disabled? Um, and gravely disabled are it's tricky with kids. It's people that aren't able to meet their medical needs, meet their needs for housing, or, or meet their needs for um, food, like food and shelter. And that's, you know, it doesn't come up with children in the same way because children have parents, but I think it again speaks to kind of the support and the safety of that home environment. Like, are we able to ensure that the, the kids, in this case, their medical needs are going to be met in terms of our concerns about underlying mental health issues. Um, and then this willingness to, um, to go to the hospital, it's tricky in our state because of the way the system set up. So I'd really focus on like, are they an imminent danger to self, danger to others, or are we worried that they're kind of 
they're not going to follow through with a good safety plan. Um, let's go to the next. Um, why don't we talk, we'll save some of these questions because I think we have a few minutes to talk and I think that Dr. Queen asked a really good question because I, I think that that's going to play into this. Does someone in the clinic need to do the PEC? How should the patient move from clinic to the ER? And how long will the patient be there? I think it's important to talk to the families about that before kind of proceeding with sending them to the ER. Um, we can go to the next slide. But we'll talk about some of those during our discussion plan. So no matter what, and then this is something that I, I'm kind of doing throughout the assessment, is kind of feeling out the, the capacity of this patient and the potential to put together a safety plan. Because um, I think it's going to, it has to be part of, you know, their, their treatment at some point, no matter what. Um, so I want to gauge kind of like their insight into what's going on and the kind of what kind of strengths and resilience they already have. Um, and, you know, I may have already decided in my mind, like, no matter what, this patient needs to go to the hospital. But I think it's still important to like be building this into the conversation about what's going on because I think it kind of helps instill hope and um, makes it so it's not so much about kind of like a focus on their suicidality. You're really trying to play into like here's some here's some positive things going on that are balancing out some of these really dark negative thoughts you're having right now. Um, I think the process too is a really powerful clinical tool because if a child is able and willing to engage in this, I think that like from my perspective, the prognosis is just so much better, um, at least in that short-term period, than a child who just completely shuts down and is just unwilling to talk to you about kind of like what coping strategies they have. Oh, I don't have any. Um, what people and situations provide distraction. There's no one. Like that's much, much more concerning to me. So that process itself, yeah, it's an important thing to do if you're not going to be hospitalizing someone. And I try to do this for every child that is in crisis where I make a decision that we're going to just kind of continue with outpatient care for now. Um, but I think the the process itself is really clinically helpful in kind of assessing how serious the symptoms are and kind of like how help seeking this child is. Um, Dr. Waldman, um, we're running out of time, but there was a question in the chat from Dr. Queen um, yeah. before she has to go. What if uh, they had suicidal ideation a week or two ago, but state they no longer have thoughts this week? Does that require a PEC if no active thoughts are planned? So my rule that I've been taught is like the PEC lasts for 72 hours. So I kind of retrospectively look at 72 hours. And I say, okay, if if whatever happened happened more than seventy two hours ago, and this is kind of this isn't a hard and fast rule, but if the if something happened more than seventy two hours ago, then it's no longer like an absolute imminent risk. Mm -hmm. So two two weeks ago is to me no longer an imminent risk, but I'd want to know why, like, or what what happened in the in that two week period. Like, is it that, you know, you are being like, your mom's been staying up at, with you at like 24 seven and someone's been watching you and that. And, but otherwise, as soon as like they stop watching you so closely at home, you're still thinking about committing suicide. Like, but I think you can act. This kind of plays into some of those coping strategies. Like, oh, that's like two weeks. It sounds like, you know, you were able to not, engage in self-harm or you were not able you didn't follow through with something what's going well and are they able to articulate some positive things some strategies they've been using to keep themselves safe over the past two weeks um that might be protective factors thank you dr waldman i think we're out of time I think we're, yeah and there's i can send um so there's like a safety plan template that i just kind of put in this that's from kind of the, the research that's been done, like safety contracts have been shown to not, not that they're not, it's not helpful to do a safety contract, but it doesn't necessarily confer kind of added benefit 
to do a safety contract with a patient, whereas doing safety planning with a patient, I think is super helpful, both from an assessment perspective, but also has been shown through research to be protective. So we'll, we'll send you, you all these resources. Yeah. I'll send out the slides to everyone that was present today. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Waldman, for the information and for the questions, Dr. Queen. Um, Thanks. What we could do is stay on if anybody had some additional questions, or you can always email me. But um, our next session is um, on February 14th, and Dr. Chandler is going to present on LGBTQ informed practices. We're going to send out the um, survey link for you to do your for CME and CEU credits. You have to do that within 48 hours, just a reminder. But uh, we're going to go ahead and put that in the chat, but I will also um, email that to everybody. But thank you for Margaret for presenting. Thank you, Dr. Waldman, for the didactic presentation. And thanks everybody for your time today. Um, let us know if you have any additional questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Stop recording.